My name is Jessica Matthews. I'm the program director at the Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecology Center here today to talk to you about pollinators. I would like to give a shout out to Spring Hill Nursery and Garden. So, yay! Sandy and Tim Belton, thank you for hosting this, giving us the space and time in order to talk about these issues and, and um, just gather today. So, Today, I'm going to talk to you about pollinators, specifically what are pollinators, why are they important, who are our local pollinators, um, some of the trends and data surrounding pollinator populations, specifically in this area, and then steps that you all can take to help in increasing those population numbers locally. I'm assuming everybody has some idea of what a pollinator is. Does anybody want to give a shout out to a local pollinator? Mary, what's a pollinator? A bee? Good job. Yes. Round of applause for Mary. <laughs> so, pollinators are species of butterflies. We have species of bees, birds, bats, moths, and other animals like um, insects and flies as well. Um, but they help move pollen from one plant to another. Wind and water are also vectors of pollination, but I'll be specifically talking about the biotic components of pollinators. So the live animals that are pollinators. Pollination, to put simply, is the, the movement of pollen from male flower parts, also known as anthers, to female flower parts, known as stigmas. It helps in the reproductive process, creates seeds that are oftentimes necessary for reproduction of various plants. So, why are pollinators important? Well, Pollinators are critical to the maintenance of plant life and ecosystem diversity on this planet and they are key to our continued access to food. It's estimated that pollinators support the reproduction of approximately 90% of flowering plants, also known as angiosperms, while also maintaining their genetic diversity. I'd really like to think about that. So. Plants are the foundation of our food chains. They're our primary producers. Herbivores eat plants. They're known as primary consumers. The foliage and fruits and nuts that plants provide that are eaten by herbivores, also known as primary consumers, um, are necessary for their food consumption. So that's the secondary tier of the food chain. Then we have carnivores, secondary consumers, and omnivores who eat those primary consumers. That's the next tier of the food chain. Carnivores are then eaten by top predators, also known as apex predators, another level of the food chain. So if our primary producers, plants, are disrupted, say we take away those 90% of flowering plants that the pollinators are responsible for re the reproductive process of, we are disrupting the food chain in an astronomical way. And it has a domino effect. It affects all tiers of life, not just the plant primary consumers or primary producers. In addition to food, plants provide a lot of other components that are necessary for life, especially when we're talking about animals. So they provide nesting habitats, building materials, materials that humans rely upon um, in order to live our everyday lives, right? Therefore, in order to maintain diversity that we need in our natural ecosystems, we need healthy pollinator populations to ensure that the next generation of plants will actually be producers. Not to mention that they support, now this number will vary depending on whose data you're looking at, but anywhere between one third and three quarters of our human food sources. That's insane. One third to three quarter of our food is reliant upon pollinators. Without pollinators, our diets would be severely limited. We'd have a heck of a time trying to get all the nutrients and minerals necessary in order for us, as well as other animal species, to be healthy. Native pollinators, this is kind of a cool statistic to me, provide ecosystem services 
to the tune of $9 billion annually in the United States alone, which is crazy. So if we take pollinators out of the equation, that's $9 billion plus that we're going to have to be spending on manufacturing and making our own food. So again, 90% of flowering plant species require animal pollinators, usually an insect, to reproduce. One third to three quarters of our food supply are reliant upon pollinators. 75% of all fruits and vegetables produce higher yields when pollinators visit them. And California itself accounts for more than 13% of the nation's total agricultural value. And protecting these pollinators is a very important component of protecting California's agricultural legacy. These are very anthropocentric views on this, meaning human centers. However, it's oftentimes what catches people's attention and makes them aware of what's going on. The ecocentric views are more encompassing on how pollinators benefit and affect our natural landscapes, the ecosystems we live in, such as the food chain impacts that we were talking about, nesting materials and the like. But in addition to all this, pollinators have intrinsic value, which means that they have value in and of themselves. Definitely in my opinion. So let's talk about our local pollinators. We have butterflies. There are around 17,500 different butterfly species worldwide, which is pretty crazy to me. Bees, there's around 20,000 different known species of bees. Birds, typically hummingbirds are who we think of, those long beaks, go for the nectar. Plenty other birds, but I'm going to focus mainly on hummingbirds. Moths and bats, there's many, many species of those. Bats, I'm talking about more of the fruit eating bats, not really the moth eating bats or insect eating bats. Um, animals also, including flies and beetles and the like. Um, but I'm going to focus primarily on monarch butterflies and our local bumblebee populations as they relate to this area here. So, Monarch butterflies. Our local western monarch butterfly, Danaeus plexippus, is one of the most charismatic species of pollinators encountered because of their beauty, their cultural significance, uh, the degree to which broad scale environmental issues have impacted their pollination or population numbers, especially recently. Um, and then Mount Shasta and the surrounding areas of Northern California are on the migration route of Western monarch butterflies. And we actually house breeding monarchs. We are on its over summary sites. A little bit more background on butterflies specifically. Western monarchs migrate from overwintering grounds on the Pacific coast to areas in Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, where they will spend the summer and breed. Um, butterflies are unique in that two to three generations are born every summer season before they do their fall migration back to their overwintering sites. I'd like you to keep that in mind. We'll talk about how we can help them locally here. So bees, around 20,000 different distinct species of bees. However, our local populations are bumblebees. They're in the genus Bombus. I'll consider them as Bombus spa, meaning multiple different species names according or colliding with them. Um, there's approximately 265 different Bombus species um, in North America. We have a plethora of them here. Um, and we'll, I won't go into specific about each individual one. That would take a lot longer than a few hours, and I won't, I won't tie you up with all that info. So I'm going to talk about the genus overall. So I'd like to talk about the trends with these individuals. New scientific data shows direct or drastic declines in local pollinator populations. Why are pollinators being affected drastically right now, population-wise? Unfortunately, it's mainly anthropogenic or human-caused activities, whether that be indirect or direct activities. So, for instance, the spread of monocropping, which is single species farming, is a huge issue for our local pollinators. Habitat loss. Habitat loss in the sense of their degradation and fragmentation um, and destruction agricultural, commercial, and residential pesticide use, and of course climate change as well. Monarchs specifically, 
1983, the monarch migration was listed as an IUCN endangered phenomenon. The IUCN is an international union for the conservation of nature. And in between 1997 and 1998, the Western monarch population was reduced from 1.2 million individuals to 600,000 individuals. That's a 50% decline in population size in one year. The species itself, Western monarch butterflies, was listed in 2014 <coughs> as a vanishing by the Endangered Species po Coalition. Our specific population of Western monarchs that frequent us here in this area are in drastic and deep decline currently. Unfortunately, a lot more than was previously once thought. Preliminary results from the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Day count that happened in 2018 indicates that there's about 20,456 individuals left. This represents an 86% decline just from 2017 alone. It's huge, and it's extremely sad. Um, it's an 86% decline just from 2017. So this count happens yearly on Thanksgiving. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the bird count that happens on Christmas as well. It's the same concept, but for monarch butterflies in their overwintering sites. We moved to bumblebees really quick. According to our Bateman et al. in 2017, about one third of the assessed bumblebee species globally are declining. With an alarming number of species classified as either vulnerable um, up to critically endangered. This includes, I'll name some of our local species, Franklin's bumblebee, western bumblebee, the obscure bumblebee, the yellow bumblebee, the Morrison bumblebee, and the American bumblebee, just to name a few. We are seeing extreme fluctuations of populations over really, really short periods of time. And analyses suggest that shark declines are happening in both their relative abundance, so the total number of species in a given area as compared to other species in that area, and their persistence. Species persistence means the rate at which they're declining in layman's terms. So in some species, Wide range studies have found relative abundance declines up to 95% and habitat loss of these species anywhere from 70 to 85%. So again, our threats to bumblebees and monarch butterflies as well as other pollinator species are primarily due to residential and commercial development. This is uh, habitat loss, habitat degradation, meaning the decline in the habitat that they were once used to. Habitat fragmentation, so say there was a large meadow area at one time, but we have built houses in there. It's more of a patchy distribution. Agricultural and aquaculture development are also affecting them, mainly pollutions within them, We're talking pesticide use as well. That is a major killer of our pollinator species. Natural system modifications in the form of fire and fire suppression. These insects and animals are not fast moving. We get large crown fires moving through due to fire suppression and they don't have time to get out. Of course, climate change and severe weather is a big one for them as well. This is mainly referring to habitat shifting, alterations, droughts, temperature extremes, and then storms and floodings as well. So, that was pretty depressing. <laughs> you know, it's good to be aware of the issues at hand and to at least face what is actually going on. But there, yes. I have a question. Um, at what point does um, the description of loss go into collapse? That's a good question. So the question was, how? when does the description of loss go into collapse? You mean species collapse? Yeah, like you said, 86% to me is like, you know, yeah. where is it going? Yeah, so it's heading to what's called an extinction vortex. So there's a certain threshold, population number-wise, it varies from species to species to where when you hit a certain threshold, there's, it's, 
it's very difficult for the species to come back out of that, where you experience the collapse of the species, the overall extinction, extirpation of the species of certain areas. So it's headed towards an extinction vortex. It's hard to answer that question specifically for each individual. We'd have to look at each individual species to see where that line, where that number is. So a lot of wildlife biologists will look at population data currently, population data um, in history's past, and they will use that information to extrapolate the data to see what lambda is, which is the change in population over time, and see what we can expect to see number-wise in the future. Now we can do modeling just on individual species itself, but there's a lot of other factors at play, right? So there's other species that individuals rely upon, symbiotic relationships, you know, that domino effect in the ecology of the overall um, ecosystem, you know, human-caused impacts, bottleneck effects, random weather events that may affect it as well. So trying to include those is difficult modeling-wise, um, but unfortunately, yeah, it's heading towards an extinction vortex, and it's, um, it's a terrible name, but it's true. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah, we can talk about this later. Yeah, I have some more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle. Yeah, yeah, this is a conversation, absolutely. Well, I'm wondering, since we live in a beautiful region that we've been working very hard at keeping intact, yeah. is it possible for some regions to kind of harbor the species and radiate the health outward again you know, for us to be a region that, that really conserves species? Yeah. Um, for less enlightened areas. So her question, Michelle's question, as I understand it, is there a way for certain regions or areas and communities to help promote, preserve, protect, restore these species that are in decline? Is that correct? Well, yes. And can those regions serve as a kind of regenerating area forest, you know, uh, I mean, if species are in decline somewhere else, they could still be thriving here. Right. Unless they're migrating from great distances. And yeah, I mean, the regional approach is necessary, the individual approach is absolutely necessary, but when you're talking about species that migrate, it's really important for all areas of their migration to be practicing the same conservation efforts. It definitely helps, you know, express, express, especially in their breeding areas and sites to promote overall health, plant species, overall habitat for them to thrive and survive and reproduce, and then that would help their migrating population go into other areas. However, if we don't manage and conserve the areas they're going or overwintering to or summering over, um, it has a very drastic and deleterious effect on them as well. So I think it's important for communities and individuals to start practicing good pollinator habitats, you know, practicing appropriate conservation efforts, and act as a model to other other regions, other communities. And it also helps because the communities that want to start it won't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's something being done elsewhere. How can we mimic or implement that in our, our region? So absolutely, I think that it can be done. I just think it needs to be done now. Yeah. Any other questions as of yet? So that, that's a good segue into what we can do because we absolutely can do a lot to help our pollinator species. We can become wildlife gardeners, pollinator wild gardeners. So being mindful of what you're planting in relation to how it attracts different pollinator species. So different pollinators like different flower traits or characteristics. Being conscious of what you're planting in your space and how you can plant for different pollinators will help them out immensely. Plants and animals have co-evolved over millennia physical characteristics that make them more likely to interact successfully. 
And these characteristics are collectively called the pollination syndrome. It's a really fascinating topic. I could nerd out on it for probably a whole day, but I won't. I won't subject you to that. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, but these can be used to predict different types of pollinators you can expect within your garden, your area, your space, um, when you plant various plant species. I'm going to give you some examples. So monarch butterflies, kind of doing a full circle here, um, because Mount Shasta and the surrounding areas in Northern California are on their migration route, it's really important to maintain suitable habitat for them to rest, eat, and drink. So as Michelle is saying, let's make that habitat, this region, um, well fitted for them to survive, breed, reproduce. This includes shade trees in proximity to meadows containing abundant and diverse native flowering plant species. Proximity to water sources with gentle sloping edges is really important for them so that they can perch and rest. Patches of moist soil are really good habitat for them. Availability of local milkweed species in meadows. We have some, by the way, on the cart right behind you all. There's a series of natives, some non-natives as well, uh, plant species that you can purchase or be aware of, look at, so that you know what to plant in your backyard. Um, the very tall one there, the Cinderella one, yeah, exactly. That is, that's a milkweed species. Milkweed, yeah. So monarch butterflies love milkweed. They thrive on it, they need it um, in various life stages. So along with native nectar plant species, which are critical to supporting the population of breeding monarchs, um, planting natives in general is a very good idea for our local pollinator species. Adult monarchs will feed from a number of different plant species, while their larvae specifically and caterpillars eat exclusively milkweed. So at different stages of their life, they're relying on different plant species, but milkweed in general is a very, very good one for them. Specifically, monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed plants in June and July, so coming up, and their larvae exclusively eat milkweed as they grow prior to pupating and becoming butterflies. Monarchs have extremely sharp vision. They have a weak sense of smell. They have long curled tongues. They're very fascinating to look at. And they need to perch to feed. So those characteristics come into play when you're looking at what plant species to plant. Flower characteristics that they really like, pollinator syndrome traits, include brightly flowered, so like oranges, reds, and purples mainly, petal color, a lack of scent typically in their flowers they're not attracted to it flowers that are shaped for perching and they have long or in flowers that have long and ample nectar tuberaries think of their long tongues that curl they want to get all up in there so local native plant species used by monarchs and other pollinator species as well includes milkweed which you can see back there goldenrod uh, California lilacs, they love California lilacs. Beard tongues, also known as penstemon, that's also back there. Beard, and then Indian beard tongues. Beard tongues. Beard. Beard. Or beer. Beard. Beard. <laughs> beard would be cool. Beard, beard tongue. tongues, yes. <laughs> Sounds like a Great. symptom. Yeah. Yes. And then Indian paintbrush, which is also back there, native plants of ours. So bees. Bees are pollinators. They eat pollen and sugary nectar. They have a really strong sense of smell and they land on flowers that they pollinate. So considering that, they are really attracted to flowers that are yellow, blue, and ultraviolet in color, typically with nectar guides. We can't see nectar guides with our naked eye. Um, insects can. These are the ultraviolet. They look like little landing pads if you've ever Googled it or seen pictures of landing guides on, on flowers. Um, they're attracted to flowers whose nectar is very sugary. It's its reward. Um, flowers that are fragrant, it draws them in. They produce a lot of pollen. I don't know if you've ever seen bees, but they fill their little saddlebags, so to speak, with pollen and they take off. They're usually covered in it. Not good for us to have allergies. Um, 
And they like flowers that are designed for landing. They have to land. They have to move through it. They have to walk through it. They have to eat it. Um, so either offering a bell shape or a bowl shape. Um, think of bell flowers. Heads like sunflowers. Um, or wide tubes like snapdragons. Bees love snapdragons. Um, I, I would also like to make a plug real quick. I'm going to tangent for just a second on not removing daffodils at the beginning of the spring season um, or at least wait to remove or spray them for a few weeks until other flowering plants bloom they are one of the first plants to bloom in spring a lot of people view them as weeds I think they're beautiful. I know. Um, daffodils? Daffodils. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Dandelions. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> I was just looking at some daffodils. <laughs> but dandelions, yes. They are one of the first flowers to bloom and a major food source for bees. A lot of people will remove them because they don't need the pretty... They, they take over, you know, they do very well in this area, or they spray them, but they don't keep in mind that it really affects the populations of bees in our area, and bees will still go to them even after you spray them, because there's no other food source available, and they will get poisoned and die. So, um, just keep in mind, if you are going to remove them, um, please do so after other plants start blooming, so they have another food source to go to. Make a line out of them, too. What's that? You can make wine. With make wine, flowers. yeah, and tea. Dandelion tea. Very good stuff. I'll talk to you about the wine later. <laughs> um, so birds. I'm thinking mainly hummingbirds right now. That's what we'll talk about. I'm sure many of you have seen Anna's hummingbirds flying around here. They're very pretty iridescent necks. They are the most specialized bird pollinator on the planet. They have no sense of smell. Fun fact, they are very sensitive to the color red, and they have long beaks with really long tongues. They hover, and they must consume a ton of nectar to keep their wings flapping at 18 to 200 beats per minute, which is, no, per second, excuse me, which is insane. So they need a high reward of food to be able to go um, and spend time at different plant species. So. Considering that, the characteristics of flowers planted or that you can plant for hummingbirds typically include odorless flowers, um, red or orange-hued flowers, tubular so that they can stick their beaks into them, and then red and orange, also a, a fun fact, indicate really big nectar rewards um, within flower species. Another trait of bird pollinator flowers. They need to be nectar filled and lack landing pads because uh, the birds will hover. So think trumpet creepers, red bee bombs, fuchsias, those types of plants. Moths. Moths are pollinators. When I first heard that in school I was kind of blown away. I didn't really expect them to be pollinators probably because I was sleeping at night and there are nocturnal pollinators. These moths or moths in general have really good eyesight and an excellent sense of smell. They hover over flowers that they pollinate. So therefore moth pollinated flowers are always highly fra fragrant, pale or white in color to stand out at nighttime. And because they hover, flowers they're attracted to flowers that are funnel shaped and very large for them to land on. Think angel's trumpet, moonflower, and woodland tobacco type plants. Bats are another nocturnal um, pollinator. We don't have a lot of fruit eating bats in this area, um, but just to be thorough, we're going to note them. These guys rely on echolocation as well as smell to find their food. They are fruit and nectar feeders specifically with very high metabolisms they have to keep up. Therefore, they're attracted to lightly colored nocturnal blooms similar to moths. Um, they are attracted to flowers with strong odors, um, usually odors that resemble fermenting fruit and the like. Um, and then in addition to that, they eat, yes, or yellow jackets. Yellow jackets. They do look like bees. That's a good question. I'm not entirely positive on yellow jackets. <coughs> Does anybody know that answer? Yeah, they're irritators. They're irritators. 
<laughs> they are. Yeah, they hurt too. You know, I'm gonna double check on that. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Um, it's possible, but I'll let you know. I've never seen them around flowers. No. Only the dinner on. <laughs> yeah, yeah I like, like, absolutely. I'm carrying up and to protect myself from them. Yeah. Really? Wow. They get pretty aggressive. Yeah, they are. Yeah. A couple of years ago, they were outrageous. Really? Oh. oh I, my I got hit by one sitting down at the lake one afternoon and ended up in the emergency room. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, a, a couple of years ago, they were, uh, uh, what was that, about three or four years ago? Yeah. I've never seen so many. I haven't seen as many since, mm -hmm. but they're still. Um, it was a big year for them. It was amazing. Wow. I never. And a lot of. I heard a lot of people complaining about it. You know, it filled up a trap up, like those yellow traps. Like, like that. within a few hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a mass hatching if I yeah. ever heard. Of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Species fluctuate in their population size depending on the conditions, food availability. Um, there's something called the predator-prey cycle as well. It's a cyclic cycle. Population trends go up and down, and then the inverse relationship for their predator and or prey happens. So it's interesting to keep in mind when you're noticing an influx of species, think why. Maybe their predator population decreased. Maybe their prey population decreased or increased. It's fascinating. I digress. So beetles are also pollinators. They're attracted to dull white or green flowers with really strong odors. Um, they feed on nectar and pollen as well, and they're attracted to bowl-like flowers. So think magnolias. You see a lot of beetles crawling in those. Uh, flies are also pollinators. They're attracted to pale. <laughs> I know, they're great. <laughs> they're attracted to pale and dull to dark brown or purple colored flowers. I'd like you to think about that with putrid smells. <laughs> so they're attracted to flowers that smell like rotting or decaying flesh, um, spade and spadex, um, pieces of flowers. It's very fascinating. There's flowers out there. There was one in the HSU greenhouse that when it bloomed, you thought something was dead or dying in there. And it attracts that specific pollinator. It relies on flies, so it's co-evolved with flies to attract it that way. Is that one of those ginormous things? Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, it has the, the, the big petal on the back and the spadix yeah. in the middle. Yeah. They're gross. Yeah. Hang in there. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so if we're going to talk about flies. Yeah. We have chickens. Chickens. And large amounts of compost. Mm. And a few years ago, we reached a point where we had a fly population in the house, which was really kind of intolerable. Wow. So we're now using spalding fly predators. Once a month during the during the warm season, we put these... We have cups spread around the property, and we receive a pack that is like shavings and larva and out come these little bugs that are s much smaller than the tiniest ant. Mm. And we spread these around the property and they crawl out with a 150 foot range and eat the fly larva in order to reduce our fly population. Fascinating. Are we screwing up our, po our pollinators by doing this? That's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it, because I guess yes and no. It seems like you have quite the influx of flies in your area. It's brutal. Um, you have to factor in your own quality of life, too, you know, in there. Yeah, it's a thing, right? Um, we want to be proper stewards of our areas. Yeah. We want to increase certain pollinator populations. Yeah. I think flies are doing pretty damn good right now. <laughs> but I don't have the numbers on that. So I think, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, if, if it's drastically declining the population, like, is it a big notice for you when you put those out? Yeah, it costs me about 150 bucks a year. <laughs> I don't think twice about it. Yeah. It really works. And it um, seems localized to your area. Yes, Joe. Related to your your comment, um, 
do you know if the, I assume it's considered a predator or something that, that you're releasing? Yeah, they um, crawl around, they find the larva, they kill it. Do you know what they are and whether they're a native species or an mm. species or something? I could you look know, it they up. could cause other problems. I mean, that might be something to check out. Could be Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that certainly has happened many times. Many times. <laughs> are, are your, is your fly uh, infestation directly related to your chickens? I mean, if, you, if the chickens weren't there, would the flies still be in that abundance? Extremely so complex. we've changed. Uh, we, we've, we've had one change in that. Look, I'm not going to go into long details, but for, for a long time, I was going down to Berryville a lot of almost daily basis and bringing home the throwaway produce and giving that to the chickens or putting it into our compost piles. The flies were coming from both the chicken and from all of that vegetable compost. I have just yes, John. You were mentioning uh, flowers that smell. Yeah. Uh, do you know if we have a native calicanthus? Do you know that? That's the, um, mm -hmm. do you know the common name by chance? Sweet. Uh, so we have some here, but uh, my understanding is it's more of an East Coast name. But they have a dark colored flower that's kind of stinky. Oh. And I don't know whether uh, we have a native, you know, West Coast version. Let's look at that after the talk. I'm not, I'm not yeah. positive on that specific genus. A common name might come. Yeah. But yeah, let's look it up and see if there it is. Yeah. And so while it's oh, this is working still. Battery died. Hello. Yeah. Cool. So while it's extremely good and beneficial to plant native plant species, um, it's not a bad thing to plant non-natives either within your gardens, you know? As long as you're being conscious of how you're planting them, where you're planting them, um, what pollinators would be attracted to them. You know, I heard, I was actually talking to Sandy here about that, and she said that she read once that if you plant natives around the edge, far end of your property, it's better with that transition zone um, outwards. And then if you plant the non-natives close to home or, or your, your house specifically, that that's a good way to do a mix of the two. Um, definitely keeping in firescaping in mind as well when planting is an important aspect. We talked about that last time. But yeah, let's look at that specific species because I'm really curious now too. And then Greg, I think it's important to find out what predator you're using for your pest population. I'm going to try to have you natural, right? <laughs> Just because it's good to know how they may impact or affect other populations of species in this area. Yeah. If they're non-natives, it might be an issue. Yeah. I like the idea that this was a natural beast yeah. rather than right. a chemical. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. I think my microphone's going out here, so I apologize. Um, so we'll move forward here. In addition to planting for pollinators, there's a lot of other things you can do. So proper forest management strategies can also help enhance communities of the important native plant species. So while also having broader benefits to the forest, um, it has broader benefits to native plant communities and food systems across the state. My mic went dead. I can hear you. Awesome. So, awesome. So other things that you can absolutely do is review your local forest management plans when they come out for review. Comment on them. Be mindful of what they're saying and what they're going to be implementing. Calling your local representatives. Encouraging them to be mindful and stop bad practices as it's associated with pollinators, specifically harmful pesticide use, habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. Um, you can help in citizen science, so that Thanksgiving monarch butterfly count, you can be a part of that. You can go out and count butterfly species or other pollinator species numbers. Um, you can help protect and increase habitat for pollinators by all of the above. 
um, and just be mindful that increasing habitats for pollinators will improve <laughs> fruit set, size and quality of fruits, pr productivity per acre, biodiversity overall in our areas. Um, it's beneficial to insect populations too, as well as provides a food base for many wildlife species. Yes. Another question. Yeah. Um, are there any negative effects to introducing pollinators um, that might naturally be occurring in a native um, environment to the native habitat. Say if you, you know, you you introduce. Um, please don't film me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, you know, if you introduce pollinators that would be um, beneficial, safe for bees or birds, and there's already an existing environment. Um, that might decline as a result of the introduction of, um, of you know, the, the new pollinators that you bring. Say like into a meadow that has a, maybe a, a, a limited biodiversity and you introduce uh, other plants which are pollinators but might have an effect on the existing um, So you're ecology. saying the introduction of plant species that are good for pollinators? Yeah, if, you know, we have a kind of a, an existing ecology here that's mm -hmm. already diverse or, or not, but a lot of people live near, say, meadows or that have a, a, a stable, uh, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a, a you know, stable ecology already. And say you introduce um, something that doesn't exist there, but is a pollinator that a plant you mean? A plant, right? yeah. yeah. That that maybe propagates or, or yeah multiplies more more vigorously. I gotcha. Okay. So from my understanding, you're wondering if it's wise to introduce certain plant species that are non-native, especially close to, say, meadow habitats like Cis and Meadow that are established. Or, or even native, restored. like a, a lupin, yeah. say, introducing a lupin into an area where a lupin doesn't exist. Yeah. It's a really good, mindful question. I mean, all in all, planting natives is preferable to non-natives, especially close to these meadows where there is a chance of them to be propagated elsewhere, right? Pollination and seed dispersal is a thing. Um, our habitat currently is changed, right? And it's not as pristine as it once was. I think introducing native plants Yes, it can cause a change or shift in plant diversity close by, but the more native plants there are, the more the native plants can outcompete the noxious non-native plant species that may arise. Um, that's a really good question. And especially if you live really close to a meadow, Sissa Meadow area, Kaiser Meadow area, um, I would say increase the native plant plantings that you do as opposed to non-natives. Um, and just be aware and mindful of all of that. But yeah, I mean, there's always the chance, and it happens frequently. A lot of non-native plant species that we do put into our gardens end up elsewhere in propagating and out-competing native plant species, and it's become a huge problem globally. Um, and there's many vectors for those movements to happen. So, yeah, native's the way to go, absolutely. And yes. I can talk to you more specifically about this. Yeah, later, right? yeah, so I would I like to. Things. Yeah. And plants, their populations move, especially the native ones too. So, where they're historically at, they may be well suited for a newer habitat now with the changing weather, changing climate, changing habitat. Hey, hey nice. Yes. Thanks, Andy. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk to you more about that. So, increased plant diversity of pollinator habitat will also enhance wildlife habitat and may increase populations of other beneficial insects. 
specifically insects that help reduce the need for pesticides, which is fascinating. You can become a wildlife gardener, again, between that club and native um, pollinator gardener. Planting native plants is key. Um, giving bees nesting places. They sell bee homes, which are quite cool. You put those in your gardens and provide a habitat in a space for them. And then not only will they stay there, but they'll help pollinate the plants that you do have in that area. Avoid pesticides. I think that is kind of ingrained in you by now. Please avoid pesticides, if and when you can, which you can. Uh, plant milkweed. Uh, butterflies really enjoy milkweed. It's, they depend on it for different life stages. And then protecting our grasslands, you know, our meadow habitats, being a voice for those areas that can't speak, I think is extremely important. But most importantly, becoming educated on the issues at hand is key and absolutely the first step. The more you become informed on the issues, the more you understand the issues, the better you can relay the information um, and be that talking piece for it, right? And then help in educating others which by the way you are doing right here right now by being here at this workshop so thank you so much for doing so i want to say one more thing if you've got concrete rip it up <laughs> rip up concrete rip it up Tell now me. you did something very interesting with your concrete in your house i ripped it up <laughs> yeah, but then you used it I, I, I'm, I'm remembering that patty was showing me you had used it somehow well, I think the most important thing I have to say, because I'm on a campaign, this is the beginning of my mission here, I want that Chinese Belt and Road ripped up. I mean, that's like, that's like my dream, if I could have anything in the world. Because what happens when you take off concrete is that the existing native plants, uh, they thrive. They, they go for the sun. They... The first year that I took up the concrete, I saw more butterflies on my little 12,000 square feet than I've ever seen before. And so that was, that was like a revelation to me. Did you have like a patio or a walkway or something? I had a, a parking lot. I ripped up about 8,000 square feet of concrete. And um, it's a ruin now. I mean, I built ruins is what I did with it. But um, when you get it off the ground, the, the, the earth comes alive. Unpaved paradise. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, rip it up. The pollinators will find you because the, 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 native, uh, the native plants are already in the ground. They just, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's my idea of liberation ecology. So. Thank you. Rip up concrete. Well, in our neighborhood, Hill Road, Rainbow Ridge, uh, we're having some firescaping discussions. Yes. And one of the things I'm concerned about is, you know, clearing a hundred feet on either side of roadways, and, and what that does to pollinator habitat. Um, you know, clearing around your house for many feet. Mm -hmm. you know, getting rid of the shrubs, and, and those are the very things that the pollinators like. Flowering shrubs like uh, rhododendrons yeah. and things like that. So, um, is there a conflict there between firescaping and creating pollinator habitat? Do you think? In your opinion? Yeah, I mean, so the, the question is, <clears throat> How does firescaping affect pollinator habitat and species in their overall populations? I mean, absolutely. If you're removing native plants, if you're removing their food sources, of course, it's going to impact them. That's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways that you can plant and firescape your house and home to still benefit our native pollinators. I want to know about that because we're having that discussion now. Yeah. And so, if there's some specific information on that, 
There is. I'm going to give you the handout from the firescaping workshop oh, yes. last time. Yeah, just because it shows the individual zones. Um, you got the home zone, which comes out about five feet, where you're really wanting not a lot of plant or vegetation materials. If you do, you want perennials. Um, then you go out into the garden and yard zone, which extends another 30 feet out. Um, you have a transition zone, you have a natural zone and a buffer zone. And so planting accordingly for firescaping will ultimately protect you, but it also protects our natural ecosystem and environment and individuals and species that live in there, right? So if we firescape our homes and our property, the idea is to decrease the severity and the intensity of the fires coming through when they come through, not if, but when. And so if we can decrease the severity in our areas and the amount that burns, we're in essence also protecting habitat as well. So planting accordingly, with spacing in mind, you can still plant native plant species, you can still plant plants that attract different pollinators, um, but, but it is a trade off, Tim. One thing that occurred to me with Tim, she thought about the roadways and clearing stuff on the sides of the roadways, removing your, you know, overhead, the with the burning tunnel that the firefighters might encounter. Um, Maybe, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that all these varieties are relatively pyrophobic. Yeah. yeah and so absolutely. they might be good replanters for that area because they won't grow up to be a big woody mess. And they might be a good border. Yeah. Um, That's a really For areas that haven't been cleared. So pyrophobic meaning um, an aversion to fire, resistant to fire. And a lot of our native plant species are pyrophobic because they have adapted to a natural fire regime here in our area. So absolutely, you plant those native plant species, it's, it, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting two things. You're hitting a firescaping approach and you're hitting um, increasing our local pollinator populations as well. In regards to removing vegetation from the roadway, roadways um, for those egress and ingress routes, we don't want a lot of wildlife by the roadways anyways. They get hit, they end up on your windshield. Um, there's a lot of human wildlife conflict in that way. So while it's a terrible thing in one sense to remove that, it's not a terrible thing in the sense of not having those negative car interactions that do yeah, occur. Yeah, I can tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. $5,000 damage. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. On the way home from my mother's death. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what happened? I hit a deer down there just coming in from, just almost, I almost made it to the club. Oh. Yeah. Not fun. No. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was. It was on the way from, from my mother, from my mother. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that in this area. <laughs> yeah. So are there any other questions? Yeah. Great. So these plants, which of them might be more drought tolerant than the next? More drought tolerant than the next. I have an area of my yard that is open, it's exposed to the sun. I'd mm -hmm. like to fill it with stuff like that. For the our bloodweed, the lavender, I mean the lilac, wondering which of those might require less attention because it's going to be kind of over there, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Like to and get I, have a, I have a, I have a, next to me, I have an empty lot that I would love to see filled with. Milk and I'm there. just not real convinced that I'm going to remember to get my butt out there and, yeah. and water the That's a good out. question. So a lot of our native plant species are are used to this habitat, you know, this dry, arid, warm, summer habitat that we have. If you look for, so if, I'm just actually going to come back here. Let's take a look at these. So any of the plants that have more, so maybe the lilac. Did you know by chance? Any of them with really fleshy leaves that are 
uh, hold water mm -hmm. and can and, and can contain it and then use it and distribute it later are really good ones. Um, um, water, water holding stems too. I'm water sure. holding stems. These are pretty yeah, robust. Yeah. I mean, your milkweed plants, they're going to mm -hmm. hold a lot of water. You can look up specifics. Um, these, not so much, right? They need a lot of care. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of succulent plants, thinking of those leaves that hold and retain water that are. So maybe the sage. Yeah, all those on water. Please, yeah. Um, I mean, there's also the sun and shade thing. Like the azaleas can't always take the full sun. Yeah. Okay. I have mm -hmm. a suggestion, just general, is to come yeah. talk to us at the nursery. Okay. You know, and you can go around and look at things. Okay. But also, um, you know, if you have an area that's not going to be irrigated, if you can, if you can help it with water from the first season or two. Yeah. And let it get, get it started. established yeah. and then and you pick the right plants. Then you probably have better success than in the future. Thank you. Absolutely. Talk to the specialist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. How can you plant? And hit all those key components that you need and for you in your yard and your space. And but when, when you're at a nursery, too, well, the labels will tell you, you know, they say moist, well drained soil, which is what a lot of them say, a lot of the nursery plants. Um, you know, out in a dry field. So, you know, you will usually say if it's drought so, so, so while we have all these gardeners here, does anybody know what you do? Fox tips. <laughs> <laughs> I have a plague of fox tips. And as a consequence, my old dog is sitting in the car dead. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, he's still alive, he hasn't been here. Yeah. But it's a constant problem. You have to like get rid of them before they. Oh, honey, so I have needed them, but by pulled them out by the roots, yeah. and I mean the entire green belt. I live in Lake Chesney. One summer, I pulled everyone out and made sure that I didn't drop one of those heads. They went into head first into a bag, and the next year they were somewhat less, and this year foxtails abundant. There's probably <laughs> seed there, yeah, seed bag. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've heard about trying to get rid of species is that you have to keep at it for upwards of four to five years. Um, Another thing is black plastic, which you probably can't use, right? Too big of an area, right? This is the sun heats it up. I think it's a seed. Yeah, well, I like to take the fire away from the green belt because it's just a girl with the seed chamber. <laughs> awesome. Will we itself propagate and it will spread, right? We'll talk about the disbursement of balls that we did. How are you mm -hmm. using that? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are we? Uh, seed bombs, I think, is how we refer to them, right? Yep. And we go out right when the pods uh, open themselves. When you find the pot that has opened itself a little bit, that's when it's prime time. It's open just a little bit. You can open that up and you've got a million seeds sitting in each pot. And then you, I haven't gone through the process of breaking it down and putting it into clay. Is that right? I wasn't part of that specific process, but they... But I think any natural, any natural mud, if you mix it with mud, and just then you can chuck them anyway. Yep. And if, if you go by a spot well, and you say there needs to be more milkweed there, <laughs> reach in your bag of milkweed bombs and just throw it in there. <laughs> That's what they do with Susan Meadow. Yep. Throw wow. It, mm -hmm. Gorilla gardening. Mm -hmm. okay. milkweed. <laughs> so if you have just one productive milkweed plant, you can you can be a part of spreading that throughout your community everywhere. That's um, so awesome. Even if you just chuck it in a ditch on the side of the road, I mean, side of a not so busy room. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm picturing some like nighttime vigilante, real style milkweed bomb throwing. People so are they invasive? Or if I've got areas that are landscape where I don't want them? Oh, they're so beautiful. No? Okay. 
Last year, Ariel did a big movie. I wonder if this will be the where they were the planet. There is, yeah. So we had a partnership, still do, with Siski Land Trust. And we went down to Dunsmere Elementary and we worked with the school kids and we made seed bombs and then we took them out to Sisson Meadow and put them out there and they're implementing it around their um, school area as well. And so they're having a pollinator garden this year that they're starting, which is really cool. And we're going to do it again next year. Um, which school is it? Dunsmere Elementary. Mm -hmm. And so we do have some data from Sissy William Trust, Sissy Middle area, which is really exciting. Can you tell if they're growing? I haven't gone out there. Well, I was out there recently. I wasn't looking for weed plants specifically, but now would be the time to go check them out. Mm -hmm. That would be fun in the future. It'd be nice if they would out compete all the sweet pea. <laughs> it's, it's true. The sweet, sweet pea. pea. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Riddle the sweet the problem is with sweet. It's invasive and non-native. Yeah, it outcompetes the native plants. So where the native plants there. Beautiful native place. Name. <laughs> <laughs> they're beautiful and have a nice name. <laughs> Does it have any wildlife value, sweet pea? Oh yeah. Huh. Bees like them. Bees like it. Absolutely. Yeah. There are always pluses. Um that can be found if you look for them. Mm -hmm. um, but they do outcompete a lot of our native plant species, which then is a big native, negative for our pollinators as well, because they rely on a lot of native plants. And then our wildlife, water regimes, you name it. I like to, I like to treat uh, things like sweet pea kind of like bamboo. Just find out where you like it and keep the rest of it in check. Each, each year, just knock down the, yeah. where it's trying to go. Right, blackberry. Yeah, I see people just mowing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a lot of times it's like between your road and your fence. It yeah. just loves, mm -hmm. I don't know, it seems to love it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that is all that I have for you all today here. I'd love to have time for questions or if you want to hang out and talk. But um, I can't thank you all enough for being here and helping the Mount Shasta Fire Regional Ecology Center preserve, protect, and restore our awesome landscape here. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Are you going to put the notes of your presentation on the website somewhere? Would you like that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like to have Sunny have, an access, have a chance to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Why not? Why not? All right. Thank you. And, <laughs> and remember, you can become a mountain patron at mountshastaecology.org. That's M-O-U-N-T, shastaecology.org. Remember to have your pets spayed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that for you. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.